Okay, M sum A14, let's go. Now F3 is, um, okay, so he, this is one of those people who does something crazy and hopes to intimidate you. From yesterday, we know what we do if people do this. What do we do in such a position? How do we actually play in such a position when our opponent tries to intimidate us with crappy moves? We play normally. We occupy the center with pawns, and then we support that center with pieces. Okay, there's no other way to do it. Now, he goes knight f6. Now, remember why you never play f3. One of the reasons that you never play f3... Okay, let's play knight f6 to support the pawn with the knight. How do we actually... How do we actually try to... How do we actually try to exploit the fact that he's played f3? How do we try to exploit? How do we prevent him from castling in the long term? Where are we going to put the... Okay, first of all, I go to c4. So he continues to push pawns and weaken his squares. We just drop the knight back. He's doing nothing but weakening his position. Exactly. Bishop c5 to stop him from castling in the long term. Okay. So, okay, h4. Again, this guy is doing all sorts of random crap. And we do not need to do anything to actually meet that. Okay, we can just play normally. Let's just develop our pieces. Um, let's just develop our pieces. And uh, I guarantee you guys that this is going to work a lot better than anything crazy. I don't like this pin. Okay, I don't like this pin. Can we do something about this pin? What can we do about this pin? h6 just chase the bishop now if he takes and plays 94 we'll deal with that when he does it i've seen that okay he continues to play terribly i mean look at okay 95 now this is where a lot of people will be like oh no you know he's put a knight on a good square he has one piece on a good square big deal we just drop the queen back we don't want to give c7 up and then we're going to get this knight out of d5 and he's going to be left with nothing but weaknesses okay so let's see what he does i mean this guy is really not playing very well so really the only thing to remember here is to continue developing naturally and not get intimidated by crap. Okay, so he wants to play b4 and chase our bishop away. Can we just piss him off by stopping b4? Can we be prophylactic here even though that's completely unnecessary? But I want to show you guys how frustrating it is for people to have to deal with you constantly stonewalling their ideas. He reinforces the threat of b4. How do we stop b4 again? How do we stop before again? Yeah, we go a4. You go, we go a4. Because we want to meet b before with the on passant. This is a very typical technique that's used in a lot of different lines. And obviously, he still has gone before, but it's not the same. Now, how do we chase the knight away from d5 while also improving the positions of our pieces? There is a great way of doing that while also improving the positions of our pieces. Simple Simpson, amazing. We could go bishop e6, but perhaps we drop this pawn. So what I'm going to do is go knight to d4. Bishop e6 would also be good. And then we're going to play c6 and chase the knight out of d5. If you think about it, the best way of chasing a piece out of a square is with a pawn. If we chase a piece out of a square with a pawn, we virtually guarantee that that piece is not going to ever again move back onto that square. Um, and uh, he's in huge trouble. Now we get to the actual process of winning. He's got 93. Now, what can we do in this position? We can continue developing with castles, but there's also free stuff that we can take. There's also free stuff that we can take, and we can start taking that free stuff. Okay, but would we play rook takes a3 and actually help him trade some pieces? Would we play rook takes a3 and help him trade pieces? No, we would play bishop takes a3, because now we are threatening to return to b4 and pin his rook to his king. Rook takes a3 would be fine as well. So in addition to everything else, we are just going to win all of his pieces here. He basically has to move his king out, which is just a disaster. I mean, this is this is a hot mess. Yeah, bishop b4. This is over. This is completely game over, and uh, he's got very few chances to survive, I think. He continues to push his pawns. He's doing his best. Okay. A lot of people here would automatically grab the rook. We don't do that. We spot for a second the flaw of this move, which is that it blunders the queen. Not only that, he can't even take the knight back. He's dropping everything here. He's dropping everything here. Okay. So we didn't do anything in this game. All we did was develop our pieces. And um, let me be very, very clear. I am not trying to laugh at my opponent here. These guys are doing everything they can. 
they don't know that they're playing me. I'm sympathetic to that. So I'm not trying to make fun of anybody here. In fact, the reason I'm doing the speed run is to help players like M Same 14, and I hope he's watching the stream. But if you are a player who likes offbeat openings, I would highly advise against stuff like this, unless, unless um, you have fully mastered an opening and when you're 16, 1700 and you wanna play some offbeat stuff, okay, that's a different story. But this kind of stuff, it might intimidate players in your rating range, but you're not building sound fundamentals. I talked about this yesterday. You aren't building sound fundamentals that you can build off of later and you'll get stuck at a certain level. Okay, so first we control the center. Take, now, how could we ensure that we control the center with pawns? Could we ensure that we control the center with pawns instead of going knight of six and recapturing the knight? And I like this move that you guys are about to find. Okay, so the move d4. I want to talk a little bit about the move d4. This is a big mistake. This is a big, big positional mistake. Why? And a lot of people make this mistake, so listen up. The correct move, Hori Plation, is to play c6. That is correct. That's okay. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help you understand why this is a mistake. Morgan, I love that you suggested this. Um, and I want people to keep doing that, okay? We learn by making mistake, mistakes. The reason a move like d4 is a mistake is because it closes the center. Now, you might be like, how does it close the center? Well, it literally creates a little bit of a wedge that makes the center more close. And more specifically, if you go bishop c5, the bishop is just going to now stare at the pawn. So you give him an easier time to castle. Remember, when we keep the pawn on d5, we're able to put the bishop on c5 and basically prevent him from castling. Okay, so by playing d4, you might argue, but wait a second, Daniel, don't you cramp White's position, right? Don't you get more space? You do, but space isn't everything. In such a position, he can work around the pawn and get his pieces developed. And yes, he's going to be slightly worse. He's going to be cramped, but he would much rather be cramped and developed than not cramped and getting checkmated. So a closed center is not bad in general, but here's what I would say. Closed center positions are hard to play if you're a beginner because they involve a lot of maneuvering slow play, but there's a lot of uh, openings that are completely good openings, which involve a closed center. One example is the advanced French, which is good for both sides. The advanced French is an opening in which white closes the center voluntarily. It's one of the best weapons against the French, but it's a very hard opening to play for a beginner because it involves knowledge of a lot of deep positional themes. Another opening, which I play, which involves a close center, is the King's Indian main line. In the King's Indian main line, which I'm just going to very quickly show you guys, white very often plays d5, closing the center. And what happens when you have a close center is oftentimes a situation which is called attacks on opposite sides. When you have a close center, you basically shake hands with your opponent and say, okay, we're not doing anything on this little sliver of the board. So I'm going to take this side of the board that I'm going to delineate, and I'm going to delineate with arrows that are not orange in order to not confuse the people. And for some reason, I'm not able to draw other arrows. Whoa, sorry, 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 guys. You get the point. White was attacking on the, um, black was attacking on the king side, white was attacking on the queen side. My, my apologies for this. Um, okay, so whatever. Um, Black is attacking here. White is attacking on the queen side. And the question then becomes, whose attack outweighs the other? Uh, for some reason, it's not letting me draw any other arrows. I don't know why, but it is what it is. You guys get the point. Um, one moment, please. Okay. So that's what happens when a center is closed. And obviously, as you guys can understand, it's very difficult to manage attacking on one side and defending on the other. So that's the reason why oftentimes I recommend openings where the center is kept open so that you get more possibilities for tactics. I hope that makes sense. I'm explaining this on a very general level. There's a lot more specific stuff to, to, to go into there, and I will. Now here, my opponent, instead of trying to develop his pieces as best he can, continues to push his pawns and create very big weaknesses in the center. And of course, we play bishop c5. Where should white have put the bishop here? And this probably is white's last chance to get a halfway reasonable position. Of course, he's much worse. Where should White have put the bishop? And why? If you guys have been... Morrigan, that's freaking right. You get him, girl. Bishop b3 is correct to stop bishop c5. 
okay? You want to develop in order to stop your opponent from developing his pieces on good squares. That is a very high level way of developing. When you're developing your pieces, you not only want to think about the most active squares for your pieces, bishop g5 technically is the most active square for white's bishop. But there is a greater priority here, which is to stop black's bishop from coming out onto c5 and controlling this diagonal. And after this, he goes h4, he exacerbates the situation. We get rid of the pin. Okay, had he gone knight e4, if we wanted to preserve the bishop, what would we have done? We can go queen e7, and this is fine, but if we wanted to preserve the bishop, what would have also been possible here? Yes, bishop b4 check is good. Um, and, and then we can move the queen, and, and then we can slide the bishop back to c5 later on after we get rid of the knight. Okay. Um, so, so here, rook b1, a5 is a prophylactic move to stop b4. We didn't need to do this. We could have just developed. We could have gone bishop b6 and b4 is not scary, but I wanted to show the principle of prophylaxis. I wanted to show how effective it is in certain positions to prevent your opponent from doing what he wants to do. On passants, obviously this doesn't get the same effect. In fact, it just weakens his pawn and he gets things worse. We get rid of the knight. We take the pawn. We pin the rook. We take the queen. We win the game. So in fact, really the trouble started when we stopped him from playing before. People are very stubborn about their ideas, so when you actually take the time to prevent people from doing what they want to do, and this, ha this is true all the way up to the Grandmaster level, it's very, very disconcerting. That's why players such as Tigran Petrosian and Anatoly Karpov were so good at chess, because not only were they good in all areas, but they also went out of their way to prevent the opponent from making things happen. It is a medical term. That's where it comes from. Um, Amrad Samer says, why not b6 instead of a4? Uh, well, b6 doesn't actually stop b4. Maybe it, it, it deafens it a little bit, but um, it doesn't actually stop white from playing b4. I struggle with moves like a4. I just never know what to play. Well, I mean, you play it. Now, here's the thing I want to make very clear before we move on to the next game. Yeah, Nimzovich was basically the father of prophylactic thinking, and he lives in the first half of the 20th century. You, you don't want to stop every single threat, right? For example... In a position like this, I would not say, oh, white wants to push his pawn to h5, and I'm going to go h5. You can take prophylactic thinking way too far, and a lot of beginners actually do that. They're afraid of ghost threats. They're afraid of things happening that aren't actually going to happen, or even if they are, are not dangerous. That's one of the hard things about prophylactic thinking, is you don't know when is a threat significant enough that you need to stop it, and I can't give you guys a one sentence method to determine that. That comes with experience and it comes with getting better at evaluating danger, which is something that we're going to talk about progressively as we get onto a higher level. Okay, but hopefully this game is a worthwhile introduction to prophylactic thinking when it actually works. Um, so I'm gonna write this down. Queen d4, he could have stopped the mate threat. Okay, we're playing an 800. That's actually the first time we are playing an 800. So let's uh, focus. And hopefully this game is gonna go well. He goes e3. Again, one of those moves where we just respond by occupying the center. This is kind of a reverse French. I think it's called Van Cruis. I'll take questions after this game. Okay, knight c3. So again, he does random stuff, and we're just going to occupy the center. The queen is defending the pawn. It's okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to do this, but I always appreciate support. Subs, everything is always appreciated, never expected. Please don't feel guilty for just being a helpful viewer that is also very much appreciated but i do obviously um greatly i'm very very grateful for all of the support as well okay so he goes d4 now charm i think of the prime now this is a good example of playing with a closed center i am going to close the center and i'm going to show you guys how to play with a closed center i'm going to give you guys an introduction to playing with a closed center now he gives us a check which is actually a completely empty check which allows us to actually support our center how can we block this check how can we block this check and simultaneously give some support to the center? Yeah, c6, and we're going to get out of there. Get out of there, and we got a nice little pawn chain that's basically giving us a small advantage. Now let's continue developing. Let's first develop this bishop. Where do you guys think we should put this bishop? Thank you, Kimball Essenbitz. Where should we put this bishop? Um, d6 is right. So a lot of people want to put it on b4, um, and I will explain after the game why bishop b4 is bad 
or it's not bad, but it's not great. He goes bishop g4. And what he wants is that if we take the bishop, he gets his queen out. And that queen is going to attack g7. Do we need to take his bishop? A lot of people suggesting f5, which sends the bishop back. That is a fantastic move. Get out of g4. We could have also simply developed our knight to f6 and made him take our bishop. He's giving us a check. It's not doing anything other than helping us develop a very nice pawn chain. Now let's continue developing. How do we continue developing? Nothing, no rocket science here. We just continue developing. We've got a nice pawn pyramid. Let's continue developing with knight f6. Knight h3, we're going to castle. Okay, nothing, no rockets. I go knight g5. Again, he's making moves that aim to intimidate us, but they actually do absolutely nothing. How do we get this knight out of here? Let's go h6 and get that knight. Oh my god, okay. So he blunders his knight. He's his mistake is that he's not actually developing, he's just moving the same piece over and over again. That's not a, okay. Now he offers us to open the center. Should we open the center? Yes or no? Are we ready to open up the center? Now that we are up a piece, we absolutely are, ladies and gentlemen, we absolutely are. Because we have not only an extra piece, and as you guys know, one of the fundamental principles of operating with extra material is that you want the center to be open for that material to, to show itself. The second thing is that we have most of our pieces developed and his pieces are super passive. He takes with a bishop. By taking with a bishop, he leaves the e4 square extremely weak. So let's put a knight there. What other move do we prepare by playing knight e4? And what pawn do we take with? What pawn do we actually take with? And this is very important, guys. We take with the f pawn to stop him from castling. Yes, beautiful. We take with the f pawn to stop him from castling. Now the king on e4 one is going to hunt it down. Let's go after him. How? What does that mean? How do we go after him? How do we go after him? Um, we, we can trade the rooks, that would be fine, but there is a far better and far more effective, which is queen h4. Sprata, very good. Check. If he goes g3 to cover the check, we are just going to take that pawn on h2. But we're going to do that only after a preliminary move. We're going to see, it, let's see what he does. He, he should actually move his king out and try to escape. He's completely lost here. And after king d2, I'm going to make a very instructive move. Okay. So what move should we play before taking the pawn in order to draw his king closer to the center of action? Let us first take the rook. We're not doing that to trade. We're doing that to get his king a little bit closer to the king side. And now we're going to take the pawn on h2. What is our next move going to be? How are we going to actually deliver the checkmate? Nerd Nation is suggesting a beautiful idea. We know according to one of our key principles that in situations when we're close to checkmating our opponent, one thing that people often forget is to involve all of the pieces. In this case, look at this rook on a8. Where does that rook belong? Okay, we don't actually need the rook here. We have enough pieces to finish him up. Where is the mate? I want people to find the mating sequence. It's mated too. And in fact, there's many ways. The rook is sad because it doesn't participate, but it, we don't need it to participate. We take... It's not mate, he goes king f1. Where is the mate? I want people to give me two possibilities for checkmate. What are two checkmating moves? Queen f2 is one, and what's the other? I'm gonna make the other move because it's very elegant. Come on guys, what's the other one? Bishop h3 is beautiful. Mate. Game over. Okay, so let's deconstruct what happened in this game. This is our introduction to playing with a closed center. The center didn't stay closed for long. Now, the funny thing is, it would actually have been hard to keep the center open because had we played knight c6 in order to, to defend the pawn, what would be the problem with the move knight c6? What would be the problem with this move? What would be the problem with this move? This is kind of like a reversed French with an extra tempo for white. Yeah, d takes e. And, and if we take, there are more attackers on d5 than there are defenders. And so knight takes d5, drops the central pawn. There's no need for, for us to allow this. And, uh, and so for that reason, um, and so for that reason, we have to decide what to do. We can take on e4, but we decided to go e4. Okay, so for the high rated among you, and I know you guys are very patiently watching, and I know not everything is interesting, a relatively high level piece of advice. One of the key concepts when you have a close center is to attack essentially the base of the pawn chain. Aaron Nimzovich, that guy I mentioned, Remember that name, Aaron Nimzovich, because I'm going to be mentioning that name pretty often. He's a pretty important character. 
He was also an asshole in real life, but the guy really developed a lot of chess theory and knowledge. Keep that name in mind, Aaron Nimzovich. Aaron Nimzovich, in addition to advocating for prophylaxis, talked about the concept of, of attacking the base of the pawn chain. What does the base of the pawn chain mean? Well, if you have a pawn chain, is the base e4 or is the base d5? He does die in the end, but before he dies, he develops a lot of chess thinking. The base is obviously d5. e4 is called the tip. By attacking the base of the pawn chain, it's like removing, it's the same philosophy as removing the Jenga block at the bottom of the structure. Brrr, the whole thing topples, right? We don't remove the top of the block. If we want it to topple, we remove the bottom. Okay, so it's the same thing. The tip will collapse if the base is attacked. So what in White's position from that perspective has been a mistake? What move should he not have made and why shouldn't he have made it? What move would he like to take back? Bingo. White wants a damn pawn on c4. And so a move like knight b1 would actually be possible. Now let's go back to the French, which I mentioned. In the French advance, and I claim that you guys can now find black's best move without knowing anything about the theory of this opening. What is black's best move in this position? c5 is correct, beautiful. And after c3, white defends. Sometimes black actually tries to go b5, b4, okay? Literally attacking the base of the pawn chain. I know that b2 is the base, but this is a little bit too slow. So the further down the pawn chain you go, the more pawns are liable to collapse. This is called undermining. This technique is called undermining. And in the French, what white, what black tries to do oftentimes is to attack the pawn on d4. That's why we do knight c6 and queen b6. And Karakhan is very similar. I can show you plenty of games that have been won by attacking the base of the pawn chain. I can show you some of my own games. Okay, so that's a very important positional concept. It sounds very complicated, but I think you guys should all understand the philosophy behind it. So that is why closing the center is favorable for us in this case, because our pawn chain is very nicely protected. In, in fact, by playing bishop b5, he actually helps us build an even stronger pawn chain. So he's helping us do our bidding. You can also attack the tip of the pawn chain. That's a, that's a legitimate strategy. You can do this as well to try to get some airspace for the bishop. Okay, so continuing, he's just shuffling his bishop around. And look at this pawn on e4. It's making it very difficult for the knight to come out. It's also making it very difficult for the knight to come out here because we're just gonna take the knight and ruin his structure. Somebody is asking, when he played bishop b, what about bishop d7? Well, the problem with bishop d7 would be that after bishop takes d7, we would have to take with a queen to keep the spawn protected. So bishop d7 isn't so much bad as c6 is good. And I want you guys to understand that. There are certain positions where a lot of moves are fine, but one of the moves is more conducive to the general goals in your position. So after bishop b2, bishop d6, he's just shuffling his bishop around. We're sending that bishop away. We could have also played knight f6. And uh, by we're, we're basically what my friend Dana McKenzie calls moving our opponent's pieces. White has just moved his bishop 15 times and done absolutely nothing. We have already developed a bunch of our pieces. So what should White's, black, what should White's plan be here? He shouldn't trade the light squared bishops. He should actually try to trade the dark squared bishops. And for the higher rated guys among you, what is a plan to try to, ch to try to exchange the dark squared bishops? What can white try to do? And believe it or not, this is a very typical plan in the French. This is a very typical plan in the French with colors reversed. How does white try to get rid of this terrible French bishop? Bingo. B3, A4, bishop A3. If you guys look at French games, you actually oftentimes see precisely this plan being applied with colors reversed. It's not rocket science. You're trying to get rid of your worst piece and you're developing a plan to try to get rid of that piece. In fact, let me show you guys an example of that just to, see, just to show you guys that I'm not lying. All of this can be observed in the French, which is the closest opening to this pawn structure. Here we go. Here's an example of how, when I did this, here's an example of when I did exactly this thing. 10 bucks from Lapham to Rita. Thank you so much. Of course, I appreciate it. Very sweet. Would not be possible without your guys' support. Here you go. Literally word for word. Here we go. My game against Jean-Marc de Grave, I did play the French a couple of times in my chess career. This game is from 2016. I'm playing a French Grandmaster. It is black to move. I want everybody in the chat to tell me the next three moves that I played with black because they are identical to what we just talked about, just with colors reversed. What are the next three moves I play? 
B6. Okay, I want at least several people because it is Lip Morgan. You are amazing. Everybody's amazing. B6. Queen E2 to stop Bishop A6. A5. Bishop A6. Okay, and so I traded the bishops, and that was good for me, and I got a nice position. In the end, the game ended in a draw because it was very complicated, but I managed to trade off the lights for bishops. So again, we continue to see that at the grandmaster level, a lot of these plans are actually completely understandable. But if you were to look at these moves without this entire introduction, you might think, oh, grandmaster pawn move, so mysterious. In reality, it's not mysterious at all. I'm just trying to trade off my worst place piece, which is a very typical idea of the French. Okay. Um, so sorry for the detour. Just wanted to show this to you guys. So you know what, what is behind this idea. Um, and here he should have considered doing the similar thing. Now we just develop. He should have castled here and kept developing in his own right. And then one of our plans here would have been to attack on the king's side. How do we attack on the king's side? Well, one good way to attack with the center being closed is a pawn storm. How do we orchestrate a pawn storm? We want to play g5 and f4, but we cannot play g5 because the knight is guarding that square. How do we prepare g5? Thank you, heard that with a Twitch Prime. How do we prepare g5? And just give, give me a second, guys. I need to send a message. In the meantime, keep thinking. Okay, h6 is correct. h6, g5, and f4. Now h6, let's make some empty moves, right? You cannot play f4, but maybe you could. You actually can play f4. You can consider it because after e takes f4, and I will introduce now the concept of an intermediate move, or as they say in Italian, intermezzo, or in German, Zwischenzug. An intermediate move is a move that is made before another move to prepare that other move. So what can you do now? What can you do now? Bishop takes h3. Now white has f takes g5, which is why this gets complicated. But let's simplify this by saying white takes. Morrigan asks a, an amazing question. And as is Nighthawk, at our level, are you concerned that we push the pawns in front of our castle king? Fantastic question. Bear with me for a second here, guys. Obviously, as I have said before, you guys know the principle. Do not push pawns in front of your castle king. And that is most of the time true. But this is where I start to talk about violating strategically violating principles, which you need to learn how to do in order to get better. Why is it actually justified here? Well, the th reason, it, there's two reasons. There is a push and a pull effect. First of all, look at the king side. Does white have any pieces on the king side other than his king? No, he doesn't, right? He doesn't. And it's very hard for him to get his queen somewhere to g4 or h4 because his bishop is blocking the queen. So that's number one. Number two, even if white tries to get pieces onto the king's side, it will be way too slow. Because what black is already threatening f3. Where is this bishop going? Where is this bishop going? Nowhere. It's trapped. So black is so fast here that white's king weakness is a lot more significant than black's king's weakness. Black has more possibilities on the king's side. Okay, I'm trying to find an analogy here. Okay, queen d7 and queen takes h3. All right, it's like... A lottery ticket drops from the sky and you know that you're going to win the lottery whoever it's like a hunger games scenario right outside of my window on the road i see a lottery ticket and um i'm here and hussein bolt is equidistant from that lottery ticket so we're racing who's going to win hussein bolt or me obviously hussein bolt right we're hussein bolt and white is like me and we're thinking, and the lottery ticket is the king side attack. Black is obviously so much faster here. So that's the judgment call that you have to make. But Daniel, how do I learn how to make that judgment call? Well, you just saw the logic and it's difficult. I want to be clear that these judgment calls are precisely what define chess mastery. It's difficult to make them. You can make misjudgments. I can show you plenty of games where I opened up the king side mistakenly thinking that my opponent had no attack and it turned out that I was wrong. That's just chess, okay? So that's how to think about it, not to be too long-winded here. But instead, he just, I mean, had he gone back to h3, he would have actually helped us start attacking. And instead he blunders the knight. And here we open up the center. Another complicated thing about the center being closed is that you always have to think about who benefits in the case of the center getting opened. Here we are up a piece and we have much better development. So we are the ones who benefits 
uh, because obviously center getting opened helps us attack faster. Okay. Any questions about this game before we get to the next one? Any questions about this game before we get on to the next one? XO521 asks, why trade dark and not light squared bishops? Well, look at this light squared bishop. Look at it. It's terrible. It's staring at the pawn. It's not doing anything, and it has no prospect. It can just go to the miserable d2 square. Now, the light squared bishop, at least it's controlling some squares. At least it's controlling some squares. It's not great, but it's doing something. The bishop is just permanently consigned to the dungeon. Thank you, Dr. Lambo, for the Twitch Prime. How do you deal with lots of pawn moves in the opening? Well, as I explained... One of the crucial things is to adhere to basic opening principles. You want to keep developing even if your opponent is just moving pawns around. Okay? Um, that's basically the fundamental thing you want to abide by, but you also want to look for tactics. So you don't just want to close your eyes and develop. You also want to see if your opponent is blundering anything. Okay. Um, I, I feel that I understand that, Morgan is taken, but, but yeah, that's, that's actually a classic thing. And I feel the same way when I watch... Carlson explained his move. Ah, I can play like Magnus, but then I play and I feel dumb. Um, how do you know which bishop is better? Well, again, guys, I'm not using anything that you guys aren't seeing. I'm literally looking at how many squares a piece is controlling and whether it has the possibility of eventually developing to a good square. Um, now, it is also important to realize, and I'm going to make a small detour before the next game, that there are cases when you have a piece which looks terrible and that piece looks so bad you're like man that piece is never going to be good again but you want to always entertain the possibility that a piece will one day far in the future in 2025 open up and sometimes you have a piece that is currently terrible but if it opens up will be the ultimate piece and will win you the game okay and sometimes this is one of the beautiful things about chess you want to think in the long run and you actually want to keep a piece on a square where it looks really bad with the knowledge that one day that piece is going to get opened up and it's going to decide the game in your favor. That's an, also a difficult judgment to make. Daniel, do you have a game to show me what the hell you mean? I do. Here is one of my games from 2008 to show you guys what I mean by that. Okay. So let me fast forward to the critical moments of this game okay so this is a game sorry this was not san francisco this was actually reno i don't know why it says san francisco um reno okay so this was in reno oh sorry this was yeah this was in reno um and take a look at my position i have what is my worst place piece what is my worst place piece what piece looks awful what piece looks awful? Yeah, look at this. Look at this piece of crap. Look at this piece of crap. Okay. Now, but let's take a look at a scenario. Let's imagine, imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment that the pawn was gone from e4. Imagine that it could magically make the pawn disappear. For, so, for example, let's say he plays f5, which is terrible, and I play. Do you guys see how amazing this bishop is? It just it x-rays, it skewers black's entire position. This becomes the ultimate beast. I am white, guys. The, the, the player listed first is white, okay? And we're all we're going to be facing the side that I'm showing the instructive elements for. It's not always going to be me. Sometimes it's going to be my opponent. So I judged in this moment that I should probably keep the bishop on g2 and not try to improve it and put it on h3, for example, because I thought that maybe one day this bishop gets opened up and then it's going to be the beast. But look at what happens. We play, we play. Here I found a really nice tactic. Rook takes f7. He cannot take the rook. I'm not going to delve too deeply into this because that's not the point. But basically, he has to give his queen up for two rooks. Queen g5. Queen takes e5. Queen takes d4. And guess what move I played now? Guess what move I played now? And I know I'm going fast. I'm just trying to illustrate the ultimate concept. Sorry. And look at this. Look at this monster. Look at this monster. Compare this position to this position, huh? Now it's the beast that wins the game and it delivers the penultimate check. It is the piece that powers white's mating attack. He cannot take back on b7 because guess what piece supports the queen on a marionette. Thank you, Annika, for gifting to Morgan. 
it is the bishop. So sometimes there are exceptions to the rule. Sometimes you want to keep a piece on a particular square um, where it one day is going to be very good. But I can also show you the flip side of this. Sometimes a piece is just miserable and sad for the rest of the game, and you can even give up material to make a piece like this happen. One of the saddest games in my, in my life was my game against Alexander Onishik from the 2015 US Championship, where I had a bishop on a, look at my bishop on a, and I'm playing black. This was, this actually was famous. Anish Giri, after this game, tweeted, I wish I, it's something like, I wish I wasn't Naroditsky today. Um, that's what he said, because of my bishop on eight. This bishop is never going to get out. It's actually a hilarious situation. They can jam, jam, five gifted subs. There we go. It's a hilarious bishop on a8, which is never going to get out. And even though I am up a pawn, black is completely lost because I am basically down a piece. I resigned the game up a pawn because he just gets in with his king and he takes all of my pawns. Okay, because my bishop is never going to get out. So that also happens. There's two sides of the coin. Okay, that is actually a very sad situation. So I'm actually not going to concentrate on it any further. Let's go back to the speed run and let us begin the next game. 